Welcome to the Jennifer J. Hammond Podcast. Jennifer is a licensed realtor, educator, speaker, and best-selling author. Jennifer's goal is to help you find your yay in every day. Jennifer is grateful for the opportunity to educate, empower, and inspire you with powerful conversations, insights, and new viewpoints. Here's your host, Jennifer J. Hammond. Yay! Yay! I'm so excited to be here. (laughs) I'm so happy to have you. And we met in such a a different way because we met in Clubhouse, which is so funny because Clubhouse is this new place where we can all meet. And I do like it because we don't have to be on camera. And that's kind of a nice thing because you can go anytime you want and meet people. But I'm so glad to meet you. And it's great to meet you. And Clubhouse, I'm loving the, the people that I'm getting to meet and This is great. And I'm going to go ahead and turn this off. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) It's always a good idea. Yes, of course. So one of the things that I, when you were in Clubhouse, you started telling a story that was just so powerful and touched my heart so much. And I was hoping you would share it. And I mean, it starts from this this very dramatic scene in the airport, but I, I think it's so powerful because I also come from a family where my parents made very bad financial decisions to the point where like for me, I remember waking up in the middle of the night, hearing them argue you and then all of a sudden realizing not only is the repo man here taking our cars in the middle of the night but we lost our home to foreclosure and my dad was a lawyer and you would have thought that he would have been good with money and he wasn't he just wasn't and so will you share your story from like your parents through to sitting in that airport and because you made some very powerful decisions to help your brother when you were there yeah, and thanks for sharing that. So I am I'm a twin and I have younger twin brothers. So there's actually four of us. And um twins do run in our family. My mother is a triplet, so it's not like completely abnormal. Um I have three kids, all singletons, and I do say that God gives you a good handle and um that guy knows better than anybody that I should only have one child at a time. So um, what also runs in our family is a condition known as Fragile X. And what Fragile X is, it's a genetically inherited form of neurological impairment. And that's a lot like Down syndrome. So my um, young, in the younger set of twins, my brother, Stephen inherited Fragile X. And when we were growing up, you know, it just, why well, I call it growing up Schwartz. Um, we, I have a very loving family, a fun family, what have you, but, and I really don't know the backstory to why the wheels fell off, but somewhere in middle school, when I was about 12, 11, 12, 13, they started kind of fiscally spiraling and we just, they just couldn't make ends meet. And eventually they just lost the home and we didn't have anywhere to live. So we all had to be separated. So the four of us half stayed in New Jersey, half moved out to California. My mother lived with her cousin in East Windsor, New Jersey. And my father moved out to La Jolla to live with his brother who was single and lived in a one bedroom studio. So how, like my dad and, and all of us actually moved originally, but whatever, in some form or fashion, all four of us had to get moved and jostled around just to make sure that we weren't imposing too much on any relative at any given time. And in some form or fashion, I just was never separated from my brother, Stephen, because I was always just kind of his caretaker and I just love taking care of him. So um, we had spent a good year and a half out in California and I'm about ready to start high school. And I decided I wanted to start high school in New Jersey. I was a Jersey girl living in California. I didn't feel like I fit in and I just wanted to move back to my friends. I like I, you meet me in person. I am so Jersey. I like I can't. I own it. I own it. OK, I own it. Yes. Um, so, uh, so, you know, long story short, um, Steve, it was just Stephen and I at that point in California and ninth grade had started, the school had already started and I'm just hanging out in like limbo, but we had two tickets. It was Stephen and I, and we're going to head back to live with my mother in California. And we get to 
LAX and Steven, my brother is having nothing to do with it. He's having a colossal meltdown of epic proportion. We cannot get him through this airport. He's crying hysterically. And because he is special needs, he just, he doesn't have any metrics for what, if people are around. So it's very dramatic. And so we're trying to get him through the airport. And this is back before security. So we're getting through the airport. They're boarding the plane and the stu- everyone's boarded. And the stewardess comes over and she He's like, we're about ready to close the, the gate. You have to get on the plane. It's just Stephen and I and my dad. And actually my aunt Sally is there. I mean, it's a big, it's a scene because my aunt Sally's yelling at my father and like, why did you do look at everyone's a mess? And it's a total crime scene. Stephen is on the floor in a full on meltdown and he's 10, he, you know, he's 10 at this point. So it's not like a toddler meltdown. It's, it's a full fledged, you know, disproportionate but people hope we I don't even know I didn't remember even people being there um and my dad says to me Barbie you you've got to get on the plane high school has started you need to go home I'm gonna take care of Steven and I was like then what I like was like very disoriented at 13 I'm the boss and I was gonna take care of Steven so I looked at my dad I said you know dad I got this I'm gonna take care of Steven and he's gonna come with me because Steven comes with me because I just, I don't know. I just thought he was mine. So my dad's like, uh, no, Steven is actually my child and you're the child and get on the plane. And I am completely uh, so distraught at this point. I can't imagine leaving him. I can't imagine like us not being together. I just can't imagine. And I get on the floor, the stewardess I could see was irritated. I just get on the floor and I'm like, Steven, you have to come with me. I can't leave you. I cannot leave you. And by the grace of God, I I don't know. I mean, he gets up, he grabs my hand and like walks me onto the plane. I'm waving back with the back of my hand to my father. Like, don't, don't look like just, I got, I got to go. I got to go. I got to go. Yeah. And it's a red eye flight. We get up, get our seats and Steven passes out. He's obviously he cried himself to oblivion and he's with his sister. So he's completely calm, passes out uh, like, and goes to sleep. And it's a red eye. It's very late. I've had a very stressful day. I stayed up that entire night and plotted my life. And I just made, I was filled with so much like rage and love and anger and all the feels like any sort of like emotion that you can embody. I, it was on level 11, like not level 10. It was, it had left the, like, I just plotted my entire life. And I said, I will never let this happen to you. I will always take care of you. I will, oh. I will be your person. I'm going to make it in this world. And like, I can feel myself when I tell that story. Like I can feel the rage of that 13 year old of like, I don't know how I'm going to do this, but I am going to do this. I'm going to make money and you'll never want for anything. And just that, oh, that like raw, like so primal knowing what I needed to do because I never wanted to see him in such distress and it was so heartbreaking and I was so in, enraged is the only word I can kind of come up with but it's so much more impassioned knowing I was like so clear of thought of like I don't know how I'm doing this but I know I will and I plotted out my whole life I really just knew what I was going to do on that flight home. I decided that I was going to take care of him. I was going to make gazillions in this world because he was never going to want for anything and he would never be institutionalized. And I was going to be a big effing deal on in this, in this world. So that's my story. And that's kind of like, you know, there's a whole bunch obviously in there that you have heard, but that's my, um, you know, that, that changed the trajectory of my life. It moved me past adversity. I had no back door. I had to put myself through college. Um, I had to start a business in my twenties. Um, I've always been, I always thought, think bigger. I'm grossly ambitious. I'm delusionally optimistic. And, um, I align myself with, with good, like, um, People always say they align themselves with like-minded thinkers. I align myself with great-minded thinkers. Yes. Uh, I don't think that I was gifted to know how to think, but I was smart enough to know that I had to learn how to think. So I better get with good thinkers and big believers and action takers. So yeah, I navigated um, my life with that vow and that's my story. And um, 
Yeah. I, I just, it's beautiful. And I thank you, Barbara, because I think it's so important, again, that we we look at our families and we learn from those uh, not so pleasant times. And then, like you said, even at 13, I remember even at 13, I was making some pretty big decisions that have lasted for years and years and years. And that's, I think it's really important to, number one, make a decision. You know, don't get stuck on the, the fence, you know, of the maybe, oh, well, if it works out, then I'll, you know, make sure Steven stays out of an institution. You're like, nope, it's not yeah. happening. Not happening. I, I not just, happening. it's all, all bets are on me. I just felt like all bets are on me. And I think you made a really good, um, a point in that, you know, we are all gifted with purpose. Like my greatest gift, I always say is that I was given the gift of purpose and it really did lead me through adversity and give me no, you know, no holds mm-hmm. back, but I believe everybody has great purpose. And sometimes our purpose is actually embedded in some of the most challenging circumstances we've been through because it actually gives us this alignment with humanity in a, in a unique way. And there's, oh my God, there's this great quote that I see on the internet. I'm going to kind of botch it because I don't have it, you know, <laughs> memorized, but it really, it just says like your, you know, your journey could be somebody else's survival guide and yes. whatever they say it better than I do, but I always kind of, I see it and read it and like, I get it. Cause I'm like, yeah, you know, whether it, you know, the most difficult times does when somebody is going through something, I can say, I gotcha. I, I yeah. know, I know I have somebody going through something right now and she's reaching out to me because she's like, I know, you know, how bad I feel. Yeah. And I, I don't sit there and say, this will get better. Or I don't say the cliche things. I'm like, you're in the suck and it's, you have to go through, you know, the only way out is through yep. and I got you. I'm like, and she's just like, I'm miserable. I'm like, I get, I got it. I'm like, but you're right where you should be. And you're getting to another better place. But before you get to that better place, you're in the suck. And I was there and they can only, I can say that because I'm like, oh yeah, I got, I know. Yeah. And you know, you said this earlier, um, at least similar. I don't know. I don't remember who it was in clubhouse who said this, and you might've actually even been in the room when it was said, but I thought it was, it was brilliant when they said, all I do is think about what would I say to myself, my younger self of 10 years before or 20 years before? What would yeah. I say to that person? And that mm-hmm. to me is such an intimate connection of how can you help someone else? Well, by your, not only your pain, but by your purpose mm-hmm. and by by sharing your experience, you know, and, and we talked even before we got on today about it's so important to share your experience. And as women, even we, I think we're, we're at a point where we're starting to really turn the corner where we're learning. We don't need to compete. We can definitely help each other in all yeah. sorts of ways. And that's a, that's a huge mindset change. It's a shift. Would yes. you agree? I agree that we're learning that collaboration is far more productive than competition. And the more people not just say it, but actually walk it, I think it really, you know, it's, it's so very true. And I think you also just made a really powerful point that I just, I want to revisit uh, because it really speaks to me of like, if, if you could give, you know, if you could talk to that person to your, you know, yourself 20 years ago, what value would you impart to them? And, you know, how would you help them through those tough times? And I, there's just so much in there. And I know some, you know, there's a difference between like, you know, you have to deal with your trauma, first of all. And I think that's a private, that's a private unpacking and that's yeah. a personal. And then when you're really able to unpack it in a level of way, ways to serve, like I'll give an example. I was diagnosed with stage three cancer at 42. And when I was first diagnosed, I had everybody on lockdown, like do not promote this on social media. Yeah. I am not, I am not navigating that right now. I was not private about my diagnosis as far as like circle of friends and family. I, I, I'm not that private at all. Actually, I'm the queen of oversharing, but I just really didn't want to deal with the internet. I didn't really want to deal with my Facebook friends and all of that. Then when Mark rolled around um um you're gonna max i promise to take you to lacrosse sorry life does happen here it happens um so um when um i was diagnosed with cancer in in november in march was colon cancer awareness month Mm. and when that hit 
I got it. I was like, okay, all bets are off. I got this. And it was like, I could take my trauma and use it in service to help others. It wasn't like, um, you know, listen, I, I loved the prayers that were coming in the, the acts of kindness oh. forever will sit, like gives me chills, even as I say oh, it. Yeah. But the truth is I couldn't just Tra- like somebody said, tr- like trauma dump. Like I just wasn't, in, yeah. I, I didn't, it didn't resonate with me. Um, and that's just me. But I will say when I was able to transform it into like, Hey, look at the, look at a pic I, I use this picture. I said, look at me. I'm a 42 year old mother of three. I ran the New York city marathon twice. And I just got diagnosed with stage three colon cancer. If you think this is your daddy's and grandfather's disease, I want to change the narrative because this is what it looks like. And I unfortunately had never had a, like I I didn't even have anybody while I was going through my treatments until later. I did find somebody that I take that back. I did a, um, a really great woman did reach out to me, looked like me and sit like was like in her forties and had the same story as me. But until that moment, I was talking with women with breast cancer and all the other, yeah. I was like, where's, where are the colon cancer mamas? Like, where are we? <laughs> anyway, I felt like I opened up like Pandora's box. I've helped save lives. I've gotten people to get their screening. You know, I've taken the stigma out of it. I'm like, let's go take a, get your cleanse and a nap. Like, stop, <laughs> like, stop, stop talking about like a colonoscopy. Like it's some sort of like, I don't know. Like we talk mammograms and all that other stuff. Why colonoscopy is like so taboo, please. You're getting a a cleanse and a nap. You're getting pool party ready. So stop (laughs) it. I just changed the narrative for you. Go get your cleanse and a nap. Goodbye. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, everybody get clean. Moving on. Exactly. And I think that, and the other thing is that you do so well, which I admire about you. And I've seen you from the Today Show to all the different um, on camera things that you've done for all sorts of lifestyle stuff as well. And the thing that I also love is that you bring so much laughter and joy and lightheartedness to it, because I know that we all go through those times and I'm sure you have where you're just really, you just can't find the, uh, the joy in it. You can't find the smile in it yet. Right. Correct. And you have to go through that. Like you can't help from a wound. You can help from a scar. And I think that like that was a quote that I actually that's not my quote and I'm not taking credit for it, but it really speaks to me. And I'm sure it was said much better than I did. But it, it you get what I'm saying is like I think people while you're bleeding, you cannot serve others. You have to you have to take care of you. And that's why I say when you're in trauma, make sure you're dealing with yourself, dealing with your yeah trauma and when you're ready to unpack it and it has service it is it's the only emancipation from suffering is to help others so i think that and yes my sense of humor is from growing up shorts because it's such a crazy childhood that you like i had to be funny and i was also like funny looking so i really cultivated i really was i was really funny looking i had like a unibrow and like i just couldn't oh dress God. right it was just i was a hot i was a hot mess express but the like the manifestation of this charming like i'm like you know, you can put me in a room with anyone and I'm going to have like the best time and walk out with like 75 new friends. And there was like 74 people in there, but I'll find another one, you know? So yes. Um, I, many stories, um, many things to dive into, but I, I do hope that like serves your audience. And Absolutely. And, and then, um, to finish up, I wanted to ask about how is your brother doing these days? You know, he's great. He's a big fan of Wendy Williams. Um, So he watches her every day. She's on hiatus right now for two weeks and he's struggling because the repeats he's already repeated 97 times. Um, But he lives with my parents. I'm his legal guardian. Um, I have him in a great program, which unfortunately is on hold because of COVID. Um, Mm. But all Stephen wants is to see his sister on the Wendy Williams show. And it is the one show that I seem to not be able to get booked on. So I'm on a crusade. If you go to my TikTok or anything, or my Instagram, my Instagram reels, pretty much everything I say is, can everybody help me do a segment on the um, Wendy Williams show? Because I want to surprise him when he's sitting there one day to watch his, you know, Wendy Williams, all of a sudden his favorite person comes on the, on the television, his head will pop off. I don't know if he'll survive, but it'll be, it'll be a great story. So (laughs) Stephen's doing great. And thank you for asking. (laughs) Of course. And I love that because you you still, you know, you're looking at how can you make him laugh and how can you continue to kind of rock his world in a way that is, is helping him. And, And I love, love, love that. And I love, I never, I don't know that quote, but you can't help from when you're wounded, but definitely from the scar. And, and we all have scars just that's the way the wonderful life goes is we're all going to have scars. That's where we're all actually connect, connected. The human experience 
experiences, there is suffering as the Buddha says. And I think just understanding that alignment is can lead way to a higher elevation and a higher connectedness with our experience here in the in the world. And it's not always easy when you're going through it. It's you cannot. You have to you have to grow through what you go through. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I'm full of little quips because that's what gets me through. They, it speaks yeah. to me, you know, I'm like, yep, I'm going through it. And so, but this is great. Mm -hmm. One of the ones that you said that I love is fourth quarter grit. It's mm -hmm. so important to have fourth quarter grit to be able to get past to the next whatever. You need to have that fourth quarter Yes, grit. you must have read one of my blogs or something. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't used that yet in, in Clubhouse anyway, but you just reminded me, I think that fourth quarter grit, man, there's no motivation, inspiration in the fourth quarter. You are just beaten down and that's when you have to go to your purpose and your grind and there's like there's nothing in your tank there's no quip that's going to get you through except head down move the feet forward show up do what you set out to do and crossing that finish line is anything but th th that we all have that like that fourth quarter even in parenting we laugh about that's the you know the end of school and where we like throw carrots between two pieces of bread and we call it a <laughs> call it lunch oh. you know <laughs> We still gave them lunch, you know, like just show up, show exactly. up, show up. Exactly. So. Well, Barbara, I want to make sure people know how to get in touch with you. I think you're very lucky because people can just follow you with your name, right? Yes, it's barbaramajeski.com. You can find me on TikTok, Clubhouse, and Instagram, all of Barbara Majeski. I like to keep it simple, so... <laughs> Well, as I would, as I mentioned to you, I am known for saying yay. yay. So I'm asking if you'll, yeah, say yay with me as we go off air. Yes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jack Canfield. You may know me as the co-author of the Chicken Soup for the Soul series. And if you want more help in getting from where you are to where you want to be, I want to encourage you to listen to the Jennifer Hammond Show 